take your seats. I'm actually going to now introduce, capping off Creative Catalyst, our last keynote of the day. There's actually two of them, two Steves. We have uh, Steve Duncombe and Steve Lambert. They are both the co-directors of the Center for Artistic Activism, and they come from New York City. Stephen Duncombe is currently Associate Professor of New Media and, oh, Media and Culture at New York University. He's been an activist his entire life and co-founded a multi-issue community activist group in the mid-1990s, the Lower East Side Collective, which won an award for creative activism from the Abby Hoffman Foundation. He was also lead organizer in the international direct action group Reclaim the Streets. Duncombe is currently working on a book on the arts of propaganda during the New Deal. As for Stephen Lambert, for him, art is a bridge that connects uncommon, idealistic, everyday ideas with everyday life. Lambert is a senior fellow at New York's iBeam Center Tech for Technology from 2006 to 2010, developed and leads workshops for Creative Capital Foundation, taught at the Parsons New School, CUNY Hunter College, the School for Museum, Okay, sorry, partially, this is printed off the page, so I'm making up words. Uh, Museum of, can someone fill that in? Fine Arts. <laughs> Boston, and is currently Associate Professor of New Media at SUNY Purchase. Please join us in welcoming Steve and Steve to the stage. Hello. 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 Is this working? All right. First of all, thanks for inviting us here. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here after a very long day. Yeah, I'm Steve. and. Um, I'm Steve, and it's super easy. We didn't plan it that way, but it works out really well um, because we're, we've got the same name. Yeah, <laughs> and we wanted to start by saying it's such an honor to be in your country. Um, <laughs> we are here from a nation to the south. It's called the United States of America. <laughs> and um, in our country, we don't have symposiums like this at least ones that we're not invited to. Um, <laughs> okay. So it is a, a it's, real honor to be here. Yeah, I mean, what's so impressive about this is that this is actually a symposium which is actually bringing artists and activists together. Um, people who do policy, politicians, practicing artists, academics, and that doesn't happen in very many places. Um, we joked on the way here, usually when we actually give a talk, we're the people that steer things in absolutely wrong directions. Um, and here, we're actually like, hey, we're actually, we belong someplace. Um, but usually, you know, we go out and speak to an art school and we speak to artists. Or, or we go down to, say, Washington, D.C. and speak to policy analysts. Um, it's very rare that we actually have a chance to bring together both arts and activism. Yeah, and combining that mix of, like, artists and activists and people that do the combination is what we do at the Center for Artistic Activism. We always planned on making a symposium like this. We just never got around to it. And, um, and, it, and it's easier if someone else does it because they did a much better <laughs> job and they actually did all the work too. So, so in any case, um, at the center, what we do is we do research, um, we catalog case studies, and we travel around the country and around the world training activists to think a little bit more like artists and artists to think a little bit more like activists on a whole range of issues. Um, and, you know, it's not easy actually combining arts and activism. And part of the reason is um, these words have a lot of baggage. Yeah, so when you think of the words activism and art, like a lot of, you know, old stuff kind of comes up. Like when I think about art, I think about my experience in school. There was a lot of pretentiousness and <laughs> it just wasn't my scene really. And I think about activism, you know, and I've been an activist for a long time. And, you know, I think about those literature tables I had to stand behind and nobody wanted to pick up the literature. I hadn't even read the literature that was on my literature table. And art had a lot to do with like suffering and being alone and, and things and like that. And having your ear cut off. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things I didn't understand. You know, I came from kind of a working class background. I had still a lot of art I don't understand. Um, and then like what it's turned into is something really horrible. So anyway, when you guys think of art, and activism, you're going to have this baggage also. Right. So what we want to do is here broaden the definition a little bit, which other people have done before us in this room today. Um, and so we're just going to start out with who here 
has acted to bring about change in their life, in the world, in their community, in their family. All right, you're all activists. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> give a round of hands. And who here has used or would like to use creativity to like create a, another space where people can imagine a different way the world could be or um, shift our perspectives of the world, show us another, uh, another view of life, or give us these sort of sublime experiences. Anybody here like doing that kind of thing? And it could be like just posting cats up on YouTube. <laughs> All right, congratulations to all of you that raise your hands. You are artists. OK. OK. No, but seriously, <laughs> even with these uh, broad definitions, it's still not easy to combine arts and activism. And that's because arts and activism actually do different work in the world. Um, activism, really simply stated, is an action that aims to have a demonstrable effect. And one of the ways we might want to think about that is in terms of that activism actually ideally leads to some sort of effect. Whereas art, equally simply stated, is a gesture that aims for expressive affect. And so you might want to think in terms of sort of art leading to affect. Now, these are seemingly at odds with one another. But in fact, we think that they're complementary. That is, is that contrary to classical democratic and economic theory, which posits that we are rational actors and that we come to reasonable decisions after having access to full information and then making decisions based on that full information, we know that that's not how politics works, OK? That is, anybody who has been an activist or is an activist knows that you're moved to be an activist. There's something that happens in your life, an experience, or perhaps just being born into the life, being who you are, that you just have to act. It's not a rational decision as much as it is something which you feel. And so one of the ways that we like to think about art and activism being connected is that affect actually leads to effect, OK? That is, is that we have to be moved to act. And then once we act, that will actually bring about an effect. And we might want to think of this as either affective effect or effective affect. <laughs> we haven't quite figured out. We're not really happy with either. <laughs> yeah, so we, we came up with something else. It uses the Latin uh, letter Ash. It's a graphene. Graphene. <laughs> graphene. Yeah. Yeah. It's called ash. And it's, um, we call it ifect. Um, yeah. this, it's not this, it's not ifect, OK? <laughs> and please do not mispronounce it. It's ifect, OK? Um, so you pronounce it ifect, <laughs> like a pirate. Say it with me. Ifect. <laughs> OK. So, um, this is, this is the pronunciation. OK. And regardless of what we call it, um, it actually, it, we're not joking with that word. We, we want everybody to use that word. It's a cool <laughs> word, OK? Um, because it's really about the bonding of arts and activism, which is harnessing emotional affect to have maximum tangible effect, right? But we've got this question about this entire practice of artistic activism. And it's a question that keeps us up late at night. Sometimes. Um, and it's actually a question that is how Steve and I met one another. Um, and the question is a really simple question. Does it actually work? So a few years back, we started asking artists like and activists, people that kind of existed in between, do you think this works? How do you know that it works? And we wanted to get answers, right? I have a background as an artist. Steve is like as a sociologist and a researcher. He has he's like a doctorate. He's like he has a doctorate. I, get, I have three stripes. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I don't know what it's in. I can't remember, but he has a doctorate. <laughs> and so really like, matter. we want answers. That's how I went, why I went to him. I was like, you know, will know the answer. He didn't know the answer. He thought I might know the answer. I didn't know the answer. He's an artist. So we know? started asking the the people that know, right? Yeah. And um, we went to Hans Hacke. And Hans Hacke is like the elder statesman of this stuff, right? He's like existed in between. Yeah. He's made these amazing For pieces. For like 40 years, he has been on the sort of leading edge of political and activist art. We've got so much respect for the man. So we, we went to Hans. Yeah, and um, we thought, he'll know what to say, right? So we said, Hans, as a political artist, how can you know when what you've done actually works? 
And this is what he said. And I, I can't do his accent. <laughs> he said, I've been asked that question many times. OK, now we're getting really excited. Yeah. And then he said, that question requires one to go around it before one really avoids it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so your response was exactly what he wanted. OK, it was a really funny response. Hans Hock is a very funny guy. But in interviewing dozens of talented and sophisticated activist artists and surveying nearly 1,000 examples of activist art, we're actually struck by how often activist artists and artistic activists duck this very question. Struck and, is one word. Frustrated is another one. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it's not just artistic activists. So a few weeks ago, we were on the phone trying to scare up money. Okay, And we have this research initiative we're working on to actually broaden this set of questions, or rather broaden the set of people we ask this question, how do we know if it works? Um, and we're talking to this funder. It's taken us weeks to set up this meeting, get on the phone. We finally get on the phone. Um, and they're like, you know, we really like what you guys do. You know, so happy that we're talking with you and all we're that. Like, we're going to fund this for months, right? E exactly. A shout and we're in, as yeah. our Scottish friends And we'll be able says. to finally prove. Exactly. <laughs> um, so she listened really politely while we pitched this project on efficacy. Um, and then she said, she said, we don't care. Yeah. <laughs> we're not interested. In fact, we're worried that asking questions like this will actually squelch creativity. And we were kind of bummed. <laughs> um, but more, we were shocked. We were just shocked that this is a person who actually funds some of the greatest works of activist art, political art, and so on and so forth. We're not going to tell you what they are, because then you'll track it back to the person. We'll get in trouble. We'll never get money from them again. But in any case, <laughs> they actually do great work in the world, but they actually don't really care if it works. Like once the check is gone, they're good, right? Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Figuring that out is not part of what they do. But we care, right? And we want to know what works because we want to make stuff that works. Like all of us in this room, we care, right? We want to know that we're not wasting our time. And so we got confused, frustrated, and uh, I think confused and frustrated because we care, right? We want to make the world a better place. We want our work to matter. And we want to know what things work so we can do those things. There's a resistance to this, right? It's come out throughout the day. And I think there's a good reason that there's some resistance to actually measuring some of this. There's some real fear, right? Fear around maybe what I'm doing isn't working. And then I'll be found out as a fraud. Um, that's a legitimate thing. Yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of risk to say, I'm going to do something that works, because then it can always turn out that it didn't work, and then you failed. But if you just say, I'm interested in something. Yes, going back a step, not just that you haven't succeeded in doing something, because we all like are not creating masterpiece after masterpiece, right? Um, I think there's a fear of the commitment of saying out loud, I am going to try to you know, make this neighborhood more equitable. I'm going to try to improve the lives of this group of people. I'm going to try to eliminate racism. Right? Like you say that stuff out loud in a group of people, and it sounds a little grandiose. It sounds a little ridiculous. Right? Like it's better to say, I'm interested in race and class in my neighborhood. <laughs> I want to engage with that issue. Yeah, I'm creating work around the social economic problems and exploring that, right? Like that's, there's no commitment there. Right, and that, we, that used to get us really confused until we realized what people weren't saying is, I'm doing. Yeah. That that part was missing. And so one of the things that is this fear of commitment, which also leads to this other fear, which we, this word was brought up in the same sort of guarded terms in the last panel which is the fear of metrics. <laughs> it's the ugly word, OK? You ever not want to make it out of an art school alive? Um, just say metrics. And you're, you're basically, you know, it's suicide by art student. Um, it's a word that many artists, quite understandably, for all sorts of reasons, recoil from. 
But we actually think that rejection of metrics is disingenuous. Um, because actually people apply metrics to art all the time. Whether it's commercial success, gauged in terms of gallery representation, prices set for a work of art, institutional success, determined by grants received, museum shows and collections, audience success, reactions from an audience, how many people show up, social media that gets bounced around, blockbuster shows, and critical success. Whether people in the critical world, your peers, critics, actually like what you're doing, whether your shows are reviewed, whether you're mentioned in articles, and ultimately whether you have a place within the tradition. And artists have completely internalized these metrics. We don't even think of them as metrics. They're not even necessarily taught. They're taught tacitly through you know, the process of your training as an artist or a designer. Um, whether it's formal or not, you just learn that these are the things that uh, matter. Um, and it takes a long time to unlearn that you know, maybe Maybe critical success isn't quite as important as what happens to the people whose lives you're trying to work with, right? Things like that, of like starting to question some of those metrics. That's what we're doing here, right? And those are important questions. Yeah. And as artistic activism itself has become more popular and funding from nonprofit organizations has become available, other metrics have been imported into the art practice. Engendering what Nairobi-based artist Sam Hopkins, among others, have called I love this term, the NGO aesthetic. <laughs> so the point here is the question about metrics is not yes or no, but rather which and whose. And the answer to that is ours. And we don't mean ours. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. We mean ours, ours right? Um, so us in the room, we, set, we can set our own standards for what success is. It's not as easy as taking you know, like a funding report and filling it out, but I think it works a lot better. Um, some critics, theorists, funders, even artists and activists will try to convince you otherwise, um, but there is no one way that artistic activism works, nor one criteria of this efficacy, right? Um, so we're, the first thing that we do when we're evaluating whether or not something worked is like, well, what did the artist set out to do? What were they trying to do? That's the best way of measuring whether or not they were successful. Right. Now, this seems so obvious when you say it, okay? Because of course, you need to know what you wanted to do in order to determine if you've actually succeeded. And it's just like so basic. But our experiences as researchers, trainers, and practitioners has demonstrated over and over again that this simple process is rarely undertaken with any rigor when it actually comes to artistic activism. Artists can give a great deal of thought about how they want their piece to look or sound, their technical aims, their mastery of their medium, but far less thought is given to what success means at a social or political level. That is, and again, this isn't a problem for artists who aren't setting out to change the world. Okay, they are the ones who should be thinking just about things like mastery of medium and technical, uh, uh, technical means. But when you signed on to the project of using your art to help transform the world, that means you take on an extra burden. You have to ask yourself, am I moving forward in that direction? Am I moving backward? Am I standing still? So how do you come up with the, your own metrics that are independent of the funder, independent of, you know, your, the critics, the peers, whatever, that are based on the piece that you're doing. Um, the first one is, is this an efficient use of our time? What I mean by this is, uh, well, I, uh, I have bad news. Um, you're all gonna die. Uh, you have a limited amount of time. <laughs> Seriously, you yeah. are all gonna die. Yeah. It's just, that's the, the I don't know game. when, but you're going to die. Um, and so we have like this, period between now and when you, I die, when you die, right, in order to do this work. And so you can't just try everything. You can't do everything. You have to be, pick which is going to be the most efficient use of this limited resource that you have. The other thing besides you dying that puts a limit on your time is that you should be living full and complete lives, right? Like you need to be a pretty healthy person to be a very good, artistic activist, if you're doing this as like a form of art therapy, you're probably not gonna be very good at it, right? 
Um, if you're doing it to work out your own anger, you're not going to be very good at it. If you're doing it because you're like really pissed off about the world, it's not going to come out as well as it could. So you need to live like a full, complete life with lots of sleep, good relationships, good food, all that stuff. And then the time that's left, you have to make this work. So with this time you have, what's going to be the most efficient use to it? Then what's going to be the most effective? So you could do it alone, for example. Or you could work with an organization that has other resources that's better at research. Maybe that's better at distribution than you could be, that has other networks, right? So what's going to be the most effective use of your time? You don't want to make these decisions lightly. Then what's the most ethical use of your time? And what I mean by this is uh, when we've worked in Africa every once in a while, you hear people are a little resentful. They're like, why are you coming here? Your, your country has plenty of problems of its own, right? So, so uh, you have to take into account these kinds of questions. Um, another thing is the most ethical use of your time. If everything that you do in order to help the world also has to make a profit, this puts big limits on what you're able to do, like the, the scope of, of how you're going to solve problems. That might make what you do slightly unethical. So the other thing is how far are you going to aim? And uh, what I'm asking here is like, are you really trying? Are you really setting out to do as much as you could? And I will answer it for you. Most of us probably aren't, right? We're capable of far more than we can believe that we can do. And so we have to do this hard work of imagining being successful, which also brings up resistance and fear and discomfort. Once we have some clarity of the purpose of what we're doing, what our goals are, that we've set ourselves, that we can be begin to develop a methodology for measurement of whether or not we've succeeded. But it has to start internally. And it starts with asking really difficult questions. I could have just listed like what those questions are. Like these are broad and vague and difficult, but that's the best I can do. They're difficult. It's going to be hard. But once you've actually come up with an answer, or at least a provisional answer of, well, this is what I want my artwork to do, then the methodology is actually relatively straightforward. What we do is we compare what we've aimed to do with what we actually accomplished. If the achieved eye effect matches the desired eye effect, then we've succeeded. If it doesn't, we failed. If achieved eye effect comprises a fraction of desired eye effect, then we're on the right path, but we haven't gotten there entirely. And I know that's a little confusing, so we're going to simplify it a little bit with a mathematical formula. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Steve came up with this. S is, the, is success, right? That's the result you want. And then the delta there is what you've achieved. The A is, uh, OK, Steve, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> achieved from the initial state. And then the, uh, the d OK, look. Go, you do it, you All do right. it. So um, this is delta sub A, and this is delta sub D, OK? Delta sub A is basically achieved state minus the initial state, or the difference between what you've got to where you, uh, what you have from where you've started. Delta D is the difference between what you wanted and where you started, and your success rate is the fraction thereof. OK? Much simpler, right? It works. It actually works. It does work. Yeah. Now, the problem is, is that oftentimes, um, we're not just working on one piece of art for one sort of effect, but we're working in terms of a campaign. So what we need to do then is have set x different goals, OK? That is, a, a number of different goals and measures, and then find the average rate of success over them all. And that formula very easily looks like this, um, <laughs> which translates out as to 6x is equal to 1 over x times sigma i from 1 to x of delta sub a i over delta sub d i. And there we have it, the formula for successful activist art. Dr. Stephen Duncombe. <laughs> okay. And you wonder what my PhD is in. Yeah. It's, it's not mathematics. So th this might be funny, but we are not joking. Yeah. Um, and we're kind of joking. <laughs>
Okay, let's, let's explain. <laughs> With relatively straightforward objectives that can be easily measured, like if you wanted your art to increase the number of people showing up in an organizing meeting from 10 to 20, you could actually use a formula like this. But that's not really what we do with our art, okay? Those easy quantifiable objectives are few and far between, and those are usually the types of things that NGOs ask us for, okay? And anybody who's an artist in this room knows that that's probably the least important thing. So what's the use of all of this? And this is the part where we're very serious. It's actually much more of a metaphor than mathematics. It's like a tool to get us thinking about accounting for the effect of activist art. That is, no matter what we do, we always want to compare what we want to have happen to what actually happened, okay? Have clarity about what we think we can do and then be able to say later, hey, were we able to do that or won't we able to do that? Now, th there's a problem with this, okay, which is, Art is wonderfully irrepressible. It's forever producing affects and effects and effects that we didn't predict or even desire. And we could argue actually that this is the strength of art. Art, if it's any good, always actually produces a surplus. It bubbles up and slops over the sides of whatever categories we put in to contain it, spills out on the floor, makes new forms and patterns that then demand new perspectives to understand it and new measures to judge it. That doesn't mean we get rid of the formula. We just make a more accurate formula. Uh, OK, so is, that's it, right? Nope. This is it? Wait, there's another one. There we go. There we go. That's it. The SY. What the SY, SY is, is a success that we perhaps didn't account for. OK? It is the thing which happens which we don't account for, which often is the game changer the surplus of meaning in art. But that doesn't mean that we're off the hook. It then means that we have to look at that SY and say, hey, it did succeed in this way. This is a success I wanted, or a success, there's sometimes unintended successes we do not want. How do we further that success? Or how do we actually account for that success so we don't have a success like that, OK? This doesn't mean that then things move smoothly. There's always going to be an S, Y, S, Z, S, Y, Y, an S, Z, Z, so on, and forever ad infinitum. And some effects of our artistic activism may not be discernible in the short run or perhaps even in our lifetime. Jacques Rancière, French philosopher, has this idea of that one of the things that art can do is it distributes the sensible or redistribution of the sensible. That is, recalibrates our very notions of reality, okay? What initially sounded as noise, we now understand as speech. What seemed ugly now seems beautiful. That art can do that sort of tectonic shift in our perception. But if that's true, and that's what our effect actually is, that's what our SY is, then it actually recalibrates the very measurements by which we'd be measuring things in the first place the tools that we would use become unusable in this new reality. So one of the things we have to make peace with is that maybe there's some things we can't measure, okay? Artistic activism, when all is said and done, is not a science. There's no singular way it works, nor formula to determine if it has worked. But acknowledging this does not allow us to retreat into magical thinking whereby we create an artistic piece and poof, some sort of change actually happens. So Steve, who, God bless him, is not perhaps the most mathematically literate fellow. I'm pretty good. <laughs> exactly. Um, has another way of talking yeah. about this, which may be a little more effective. I, or came effective. Up, I came up with this with one of my students from the museum school in Boston, who I'm pretty sure was a huge stoner. <laughs> And, um, okay. and as you do this, think about, you got to put Pink Floyd. Yeah, it works. It think, works. Think, this, this is like another way that Money. I, <laughs> so, all right, so there's this old model of communication. And you probably may have seen this kind of thing before. The idea is that you have a speaker and an audience, right? And um, the speaker encodes an idea in their mind. They think of something they want to say. 
They articulate it out through their mouth. They make it into a sound. The um, audience person hears it as you are now, right? Like I'm trying to convey an idea. I've thought of this idea. I have a combination of words and pictures. That idea enters your brain. And then you know we have communication. And in this model, if the idea I'm thinking of and what you're thinking of are different, then there's a problem, right? Like we have a problem in our communication. Um, what this student, I'm not going to say his name, uh, was like, yeah, man, but that's not how art works. <laughs> and, uh, and so we came up with this, which is you take concepts, you embed them into an artwork, and they actually have layers of meaning, right, that come out the other side. So we're not just trying to get one meaning across, but multiple meanings, right? I make work sometimes that there's a sort of literal meaning that rich people like, which is like, you know, everything you want right now. And they're like, oh, I love it. It's so funny. <laughs> and then I'm like, no, it's really about how advertising lies. And they're like, whatever. I don't care about this. <laughs> you know, but they're getting all the layers. Just one's resonating more than the other. Um, then there's other people who are just like, it's so pretty. Um, and they're getting a different layer. And there's people that get all of them, right? And they get them in different amounts. But the point is, this is the great thing about art, is that it, can, it conveys all these meanings. Um, the, the, the other thing that, that I kind of figured out by talking to the stoner kid was that um, the artwork actually works like a prism, right? You don't go it, into an there's artwork. The, there's the Pink Floyd yeah. entry, just in case you didn't get that. You didn't have to tell them. Oh, some people. There's so, millennials in the crowd. They don't understand. That's true. All right, if you were born after 1995, there's this album. <laughs> um, so. 1995, is that, that's not even, you, you were born, you were born after 95? Okay. <laughs> In 95. Woo. Okay, so, um, so there's this album called The Wall. No. No, no, it's Dark Side of the Moon. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. They're Steve's both good, but the early stuff, <laughs> what you want to do is get metal, get metal, that's a good one. Okay, so, um, so the idea is that, uh, you have to have a very clear idea, right? And when you have a very clear idea, a focused beam of light that goes into that prism, then you get the rainbow. Yeah, because how, how prisms work is actually, if you just put them in the light and it's diffuse light, nothing comes out the other side, okay? What you have to do is have a razor sharp focus of light and then you get the broad band of spectrum and it, and, and it goes out. And this is often misunderstood, like I have this razor sharp intention and I want to get this idea across. I have an outcome I want, there's a meaning I want, I'm, you know, I'm very specific, that that's all that comes out the other right. side. It's not true, right? But, like really great stuff has, that's propaganda, basically. Right. We're not advocating for propaganda, right. we're advocating for art, where like you have this intention and then you have this, these, all these different things that can come out the other side, including meeting some actual objective goal. But the other error, um, if one error is about expecting there to be a unified meaning that comes out of one of your artwork, the other era, it, error is to not have that clear intent. The idea that, in fact, I don't really know what my art wants to do. I'm just really pissed off about the war, and I'm just going to just put stuff, just put stuff together. And somehow, some sort of message will come from that, okay? Think about the prism. Nothing comes from that. So, okay. So, in any we? case, uh, we're here. <laughs> okay. The Pink Floyd thing kind of threw you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so look, here's the bottom line. There is no singular formula that's going to work, okay? There's no metrical formula that can be applied to all our statistic activism. Um, but if we're going to take the practice seriously, if we truly believe that art can change the world, we always need to be thinking about our intent as artists and activisms. And this is really simple, and it boils down to two questions, which is, what work do we want our artistic activism to do, and how will we know if it works? And I'll add a third one, the SY, which is being attuned to and accounting for the other colors of the rainbow that come out as well. So there's a lot of really great ideas you guys have talked about at this conference. I mean, one of the real honors of being here, besides being in Canada, is that to be among all these people that See, like, don't laugh. In the United States, we'd never laugh at that shit. We'd be like, damn right. So 
but that you guys are, I mean, it seems like more than half of you are on stage, right? Um, like, you're like really amazing people doing this work, right? So um, what do you want to do? What do we want to do with these ideas at the end of today? And it's all nice and poetic, right? We don't, we don't want to just like have a bunch of rainbows and getting high, right? <laughs> um, how is this going to help us in the here and now? Yeah. How are we going to do something? Yeah. What are our aims as we're walking out of here? So our question for you is, what are you going to do, right? Because just like thinking about these ideas, being real clever, coming up with criticism, knowing that you know about this stuff and other people don't, um, that's not enough, right? Like just thinking about it, considering it, also not enough. Uh, Steve thinks this might upset you guys. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> it went, this is what happens to me, OK? Yeah, I'm, so I'm going to make it personal. Yeah, talk about yourself. Yeah, I'm going to own it. I'm going to own it. <laughs> so when I'm at home, I have this partner, Victoria. She's a wonderful woman. Um, but you know, I work in the house sometimes. If I'm thinking about stuff, it looks like this. Like, when I'm not doing anything, it looks like this. <laughs> and she can't tell when I'm thinking and when I'm not doing anything. <laughs> and so she'll come and be like, hey, can you go get the groceries or whatever? And I'll be like, I'm trying to concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, if you just think about stuff, it's basically the same as doing nothing. <laughs> okay? You have to like put those thoughts into action. The thoughts are in a step onto changing stuff. We want to change things. We want to do things, OK? So making successful artworks also isn't enough. If you go leave here and you're a curator, you're an artist, and you make a great show, and you put it on, and systemic racism continues, right? Or like inequality continues. Like, are you really satisfied? Right. Cool, you made some great artworks. You made it put on a good show. You got a catalog. But like, so what? You got to ask the question, what's the effect? Yeah. Um, successful activism, you can leave here. You could change laws, right? Like you could have tons of people sign a petition and you could change policy, a big bad corporation, right? But what does that do? Sometimes it doesn't do anything. Like we've got laws in the United States that say you can't discriminate based on race. Still happens, right? Like those corporate policies might be right, but they still are doing the wrong things, right? So the culture has to change too. Yeah. So if you're doing activism, then the question is, Where's the affect, right? So people have to desire change. They have to feel it. And they also have to act upon it. In other words, we always have to be thinking about what is the I effect of what we do? And if you guys in this room can't do this stuff, like, we're fucked. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> because because you, like, you guys get it. You're smart and you're creative. And no one else is going to come and like, sweep in and save us all, right? Like, who's better than you guys? Who's going to come and be like, hey, it seems like maybe this isn't working. Like, let me, give you, let me coach you. Like, that's not going to happen, <laughs> OK? You guys have to be the one to do this. And it's going to be hard. And it's not all going to work every time. Like I said, it's not going to be a series of continual masterpieces. But we've got to go out there, and we've got to do stuff. So we got some questions for you to keep in your mind and to put into action as you leave here today. The first one is, who are you going to team up with, OK? This is yeah. too big a problem for any individual artist. I know we have this whole idea of like the artist and the garret, you know, so and so forth. Bullshit, OK? <laughs> Even that artist had someone cooking for them or doing something for them, OK? There was something behind them. We work better when we work together. We work better. We have more creative ideas when we actually brainstorm together. And all of you that have done the workshops know that, OK? So who are you going to team up with? Next one is, what are you going to get done tomorrow? Next one. Oh, yeah. go. go ahead. <laughs> what are you going to get done this week? That's your line. I know. I'm giving them time to think. Oh, nice. <laughs> I want you to think about it. <laughs> what are you going to get done by the end of this year? Whatever you are thinking about right now, some of you are doing the right thing. Some of you are not. You should be writing this down, OK? 
<laughs> the stuff that you are thinking about right now, write it down. And then what you got to do is once you write it down, go home and post it above your desk so you cannot escape it. Every time you sit down at your desk, your drawing table, you're like, oh shit, that's what I want to do. That's what my aim is. I'm going to do it. Yeah, because you're going to keep getting emails, you know? <laughs> A good way to ensure that you actually do this is uh, tell other people, I'm going to get this done by the end of the year, because then it's just really embarrassing if you don't. <laughs> uh, <sometimes laughs> that pressure works for me. <laughs> Your friend will come over and go, hey, how's that project you're working on? You're like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I love peer pressure is good for you. Yeah. Um, and last thing is to do it. Like, we need you guys to do this stuff. Whatever it is you're thinking. Now, the, the great thing is you don't have to come to consensus in here on like, what we're all going to do. Right. All of you can go off and do different things. Right. And we're all going to like, you know, work together in the sort of bigger collective way. But all of you guys have different values, different ideas, different amount of time and energy. Millennials have more energy um, that you can put towards this stuff and move forward, right? We're not all going to have the successful idea. So a lot of us are not going to be able to pull something off in the next year that really makes the impact that maybe we hope. But a couple people in here will, yeah. right? And so you all have to do it. And, and the key here, again, goes back to what we started with, which is there is no one way to do this. And we're not saying that there is. We're saying have clarity about what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, and then hold yourself up to that standard. Be really serious about the work that we do. We have to be serious about the work that we do because we have to change the world. So we look forward to the great things that a couple of people in here are going to do. <laughs> and that will come and from our forward. neighbor to the north. Yeah. <laughs> And we look forward to the noble efforts that the rest of us are going to make, yeah. right? We have no idea which is which. And we also want to say thank you. Yeah. And you can find out more about what we do at artisticactivism.org. And we have great examples of creative actions that you can add to as you work over the next year and beyond on actopedia.org. As you do stuff, you can put things up there. It is a free. Open, open source, user-generated database of creative activism examples. So if you want to get inspired, it's a great place to get inspired, too. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, actually, I was just thinking maybe we can open it up a bit for the audience to see if they yeah. have any questions for you. Yeah, definitely. Anyone? Oh, yep. right over here. Microphone's coming. OK, um, I'm returning the question to you. Um, what are you doing this year? <laughs> oh, good question. Ah, uh, we can answer that. Damn. Um, so one of the things that we've thought a lot about is that we've been doing these trainings for five years. Um, and we really want to expand the amount of people that we can actually reach um, and also uh, open up the whole process to other folks who you know, we can't go to see or they you know, can't come to see us and so on and so forth. So one of the things we're doing is we're actually just finishing up a book. Um, and you're going to love this part. It's not one of those boring books. <laughs> it's not like a how-to such and such or best practices. It's a self-help book. You're going to have commitment exercises. And it's kind of ironic, but like everything we do, it's kind of not. <laughs> um, and so that's one of the awesome things we're doing. We're also working with um, actually a colleague of many people in this room, or a number of people in this room, Stuart Candy, who teaches at OCAP. OCAP um, who, and we're building a card game um, to sort of stimulate creative ideas to about tactics creative action. to come up with creative actions. Um, Every month. We oh. do a podcast of uh, we go to the worst stuff. Uh, we do, it's like a it's like fear factor for yeah. Yeah. for us. Um, so we go to these incredibly popular things. Like we saw Transformers: Age of Extinction. That Which was a, it's the number then, one selling movie in the world last in year. In 2014, it was the number one movie. Yeah. Um, the most recent or oh, the, we listened to like the top some songs from the Billboard Top 100. 
which are, some of them are really awful. And, um, but anyway, they're very popular. And so we, on the podcast, we like yeah. figure out why they're popular and try to figure out what we can learn from them. Yeah, and so, how, how we can use some of those lessons for our activism or for our art. Um, popular culture, we may not like it all the time, but it's popular. Okay? And if we're going to learn how to speak to people, we need to figure out what people like. So what are we doing next, Steve? Oh, Manny we're getting Petty. Manny Petty's, yeah. Manny Petty. Yeah. <laughs> Pop culture salvage expedition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're doing that. And then Steve's writing a book on the New Deal. Yeah. And I am making a game show. Yeah. And we're trying to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> and live full and complete lives. <laughs> what are you doing? I lead them, the Toronto Urban Sketchers. We sketch around the city, uh, different buildings and stuff like that. And this year, we decided to come up with a book. And we're uh, sketching the disappearing landmarks of Toronto that are being replaced by condos and making an illustrated book about it. So that's my project. Awesome. <laughs> cool. We're going to hold you to it. She said it here. <laughs> There's one over here. So um, oh. with Macedonia, we worked uh, twice in Eastern Europe, uh, one in Macedonia and one in Russia. And just to um, explain, Macedonia is part of the uh, former Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia. and yeah. as they say, is uh, the second most repressive for LGBT people next to Russia. Yeah. And so we worked with LGBTQ um, uh, activists and Roma rights activists. And um, it's hard to be a activist there. Like they are, are attacked. Like the, there's a video online you can see of just people, like a mob charging and just trying to destroy an LGBT center in their right. downtown. <clears throat> and so what we do is we do uh, a five-day training. The first three days, we do sort of you know, exercises, a lot of stuff on social marketing, history, uh, theory, like just so everyone understands how this stuff works. And then for the last 24 hours, and it's important that it only happens in 24 hours, we brainstorm, plan, build all the props, and execute an action. Um, and in 24 hours. And, and usually, like, activists like this plan something three months ahead right. and, like, pick the dates. And, you know, there's all these organizing and meetings. So doing it in 24 hours is really yeah. unusual. Um, so it will fail. Yeah. So it doesn't part, work. Yeah, it doesn't work. And then at the end, I mean, parts of it fail and parts of it succeed. And then people at the, at the end say, okay, how can we do it better? To get so, this idea that everything is sketches. Yeah, so for example, in Macedonia, uh, Macedonia also is known as the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia uh, in the UN, and, or F-Y-R-O-M. And because the name Macedonia is disputed with Greece, Greece claims to be on that territory. And um, so they're known as the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. So we created a new country in their park, uh, in their capital, called the, the, future, the Republic future Republic of, of, the of the former Macedonia Repub of the former Republic of Macedonia. <laughs> exactly. um, and we made passports and everything. And uh, this country was based on love. And you, could, you wrote your gender in pencil. And it was on a spectrum. And you could change it and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, see, and why we did that is because after working with these people for three days, one of the things that came out was they had been so beaten down and so embittered and so embattled. And we said, let's brainstorm an action. They're like, yeah, let's go fuck something up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we're like, OK, but the problem is, is that the state is saying you guys are outsiders as Roma and queers. You doing that is actually just saying that message in a different way. So we said, we talked a little bit more. And like, what do we ultimately want? Yeah. We want a better country, yeah. right? It's it so, about futures. Yeah. And so we built that country. And the mistake we made, the way it failed, I mean, it was in many ways very successful. And they actually described it as one of the most successful actions they had done in several years, as far as attendance and the spirit of it. But we <laughs> forgot to call the press. <laughs> yeah. So we make mistakes like that. <laughs> And then the next day, we're like, OK, what could, how could we do this better? You know, like, what did we learn from right. this? So it's meant to be clearly a sketch for something else, yeah. but also to show them, like, all right, well, if a bunch yeah. of you get together and decide to do something, you can do something pretty successful really quick. Right. And it's bringing in that art, art process, design process that all of you guys are very familiar with, yeah. but among hardcore activists is like totally new. Yeah. And it, it, just to get to the SY, 
um, <laughs> is that we were, we were down in South Africa working with sex workers last month. And we planned this big, complicated action. It's too big and complicated to understand. Um, but it worked in a very local, specific setting, OK? And that, that was the sort of key. All culture is local. All meaning is local. Um, the signs and the symbols have to resonate with the South African population. And it's in Cape Town. We had a side part of this, which was an Ask a Sex Worker booth, OK? Um, so we, it was like a big like kissing booth, but it said Ask a Sex Worker. Right. Kissing booth may be the wrong reference point. <laughs> um, and then you could come, and it was like a free space where you just ask some questions. So all day long, it was the most popular yeah. part of it. And we would have never predicted that, that this would be the most popular. The big conceptual thing we did about glasses and mirrors and reflections totally failed. <laughs> Nobody had an idea. But, but like this totally succeeded. Families would approach the Ask a Sex Worker booth, and at the end of the day, I was like, so what did you talk about? She's like, well, we talked about the, the criminal um, or you know, violence against sex workers and how we're in danger and how the laws affect that. And she's like, the weird thing is we never talked about sex. Yeah. 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 And so it was completely effective. And I didn't even guess that, that that's how that would work. Yes, you know? exactly. Other questions? Yes. Uh, so one thing I've learned today is that the role of student and teacher um, changes frequently and I'm, I'm really happy to be in a room of people who seem to be students and teachers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an undergraduate student in the States and I'm curious about your work with uh, university students or university groups and how you think that um, your work could be better implemented on campuses. We are both university professors. Yeah. Do you want to start? I was going to punt it to you. Okay. So uh, I, I I have a very supportive university, and um, you know I have to teach some foundation stuff, but I do get to teach basically like creative activism. And um, do you want to know like how I do it, or what? What, what do you want to know? Uh, sure, how you do it, and then also your experience working within universities and the bureaucracy of a university, mm -hmm. and oh, okay. um, within arts programs that perhaps uh, exist with um, limitations based yeah. on their bureaucratic situation. All right, I'll, so like, there's certain stuff I tell them I'm doing, and there's other things I don't. Yeah. 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 So one thing was I make them all make $100 in a week. And if they don't, I will fail them. Your students. I make my students make $100. And then they bring the $100. I, I kind of stole this from John Rubin, who's like another amazing artist. Um, but they have to bring the hundred dollars. We put it in a big pile. We take a picture around our pile of money, and then I tell them, "You will not be able to determine individually what happens with this money after this, right? If you don't like that, don't take the class." Now, uh, and then, and then the class, if it's like twelve people, we have twelve hundred dollars. They can do whatever they want with, and then suddenly they have this agency, right? Like they can make a project that has a budget, independent of the school. They, we don't have to ask anybody for permission, like. We rent bouncy castles and we buy bicycles and like whatever we want to do. Like there was a point where like we could buy an old Cadillac, you know? It's like <laughs> it's like oh shit, what is that? Where's this gonna go? Yeah. You know? um, but uh, you know, I mentioned it to my chair or something, and she was like, oh, you can't, you know? It's like it brought up all these thorny things. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> And then she knew not to ask me about it later, and I knew not to tell her about it later, and that's I just keep doing it. And you know, I, every student is able to make a hundred dollars in a week. You know, like they sell stuff, they 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 uh, they make things and sell it. And and that part even is really empowering for them to figure out that they can, if they need to, make money. And then when they combine that money, they become even more powerful, which is like the better lesson. Um, and so it's just like selectively telling them what we're doing and what we're not doing. And, and there's parts they really love, like we teamed up with this um, immigrant worker uh, group in the next town over, and we did this project with them where we hired day laborers that, whose wages had been stolen. We hired those workers for a day to take the day off, basically like a paid holiday. And they cooked them like a barbecue and then gave them a giant check for you know, the money that, and just hand it over and let them go home. Um, so, so, like, the school loves when that happens. They just don't love how it happens. And they don't want to know how it happens, right? I, I'm a little bit straighter in my, uh, my university in 
that I actually don't talk about politics much in my class. Um, I actually teach very straight stuff on sort of the history of media, like the printing press and the Bible and things like that. How do you not talk about politics? Uh, we do, well, of course, I talk about politics all the time. But I'm actually, <laughs> I'm reluctant to make my classroom into an activist space. Um, and I'm reluctant to make it into an activist space because I actually think that when, say, we go and work with activists and artists, our intention, our aim, is to try to overthrow power. And I'm not sure, given the power I have as a grading professor, that I can do that. And again, I'm not saying that this is the right thing or the wrong thing. And I've started to cross the line a little bit more with graduate school with students, OK? But I actually am much more interested in having them try to figure out for themselves how to make sense of the world, how to criticize the world. But this is where I am an activist. I insist that they act in the world. And they can act by working in an advertising agency. They can act by doing things that I would prefer that they didn't do, OK? But I do think that's the one place where I really do push my students is to move away from just contemplation and actually put those ideas into some sort of action. But um, so yeah. you're not like imposing. I'm not. I, mean, I think both of us are very careful about not imposing. Yeah, not imposing exactly. Well, we're going to work with this group or we're going to work with that group. And with your group, you know, the students came up with that themselves. Yeah, yeah. So it's you know it's fun. But I think that the work that we do in the university is a little bit different than say the work that we actually do in our activist practice. And I actually like the separation. My dean. When we said, hey, would you like to sponsor this? We actually, you know, we need a sponsor. She goes, you do not want to be asking my permission for the stuff, the crazy shit you guys are going to do. <laughs> and I walked out of there being like, man, she's so square. <laughs> and then I realized she was so right. <laughs> she was so right. <laughs> Justin. So I just wanted to um, to circle back to one part of the presentation because there was, um, you know, when you're asking us what is it that we that we're going to do tomorrow and next week and into the next year, there was something that you had that that I had heard in another one of your presentations, Steve, which was um, it was a really simple exercise, but it was a way of I think trying to clarify that question, and it was kind of the and then what question. Mm, and I'm yeah. wondering if you might just kind of re-illustrate that, because <laughs> it stuck with me like forever. I was supposed to go in this draft, and we totally spaced out on it. That's why I'm laughing back here. Um, so this is this thing that we started. Well, it came out of work I was doing, but we do it in every workshop we do with activists. And so I guess I'll talk about that. It's like, we have everyone imagine what it would be like for them, whatever they're working on right now, to be successful, to win that. And so these are, you know, in Texas, it's like people trying to uh, change the tax structure or something like, well, it would be to pass SB 730. You know, like if we pass that, that Senate bill, then it would go to the uh, other part of the Texas legislature, and then we, that would be golden, you know? And we're like, okay, guess what? You did it. And they're like, what? You know, because they'd never imagined even that happening, right? Um, and they're like, okay, what do you want to do after that's done? And oftentimes they're a little dumbstruck, you know, but then something comes quick. It's like, oh, well, then we need to make sure that was enforced, right? And like fair and didn't get rolled back. Like, okay, you did that too. You were great. What do you want to do next? And they're like, oh, okay. So then they have to think a little bit bigger and they usually come up with something like, uh, we passed another law. We're like, okay, you passed the law. You're really amazing. <laughs> And uh, you know we've come from the future. We have good news. You did it. Uh, what do you want to do after that? And they get a little lost. They get nervous. You know, like they've never imagined actually being successful at this stuff. And we just keep pushing. Like, what would happen after? What would you do after that? And what's amazing after doing this in all these different countries is they get to a very similar place. They get to the world that we'd all like to live in. Um, and they describe it incredibly similar ways, which is, well, people would be smiling. Um, I would smell, enter your national food in here, that food wafting. I would hear children laughing. I would feel, you know, feel uh, warm air on my skin. And they often say, and I wouldn't be an activist. Uh -huh. um, and this is the place that we need to always visit, because this 
is why we became activists or artists who are interested in changing the world. And very importantly, it's the world that other people are going to be interested in joining us in. Yeah, no one becomes activists because they want to be an activist, right? Like there, there's some deep-seated sense of injustice or something they want to do in the world. And if, you, if I went to Steve and I was like, look, you have to, you have to work with me because we've got to pass SB 730. It's like, well, uh, I don't know. Yeah. But if it's like, hey, man, I want to make a world where people feel a sense of leisure that, uh, you know, everything sort of doesn't, it doesn't, well, you don't want to get too crazy and say it's all free. People get weird about that. You sound like a communist. Maybe not in Canada. But, um, uh, but, you know, like a sense of leisure, there's abundance, there's a, you know, natural world around you. Or start, and start talking about the vision. Like, everyone gets into that vision. They're like, okay, the way we get to that first step, we got to pass yeah. SB 730. And, and, and we'd then like they're to, in. And we'd like to think that we actually came up with this idea. But, of course, this is how advertising works. All of advertising is built on a dream. It's utopian. It's the ideal of a future which often the product itself isn't even a part of. You know, what is Coke's slogan now? Open happiness. Now, the difference between what we do in this room and what Coke does is they are lying sons of bitches, OK? <laughs> Insofar as actually Coke will not bring you happiness. I mean, it tastes good, right? But the more you drink, the less happy you're going to get, OK? Because you're going to get diabetes, you're going to get sick, and all that sort of stuff. But what we do is we actually deliver the goods. Saying, actually, passing this bill about a fair state legislature budget is actually going to bring us one step closer to utopia. We're never going to reach utopia, but it does bring us that one step closer. And so what, but advertisers are smart. They realize that no one buys the product for the product. They buy it for the dream. And we have an ethical way to actually deliver on dreams. And so we've got to like articulate those dreams. We've got to show people what those are and let them understand how we start moving towards that. Artists are really good at that. Designers are really good at how to present that. And that's when, that's how you get to the I effect, right? It's like com combining that ultimate outcome with this vision. All right. All right. Thank you so much to Steve and Steve. Thank you. That was an incredible presentation. And I hope it inspires everyone here to go out and just do stuff and take risks and don't be afraid of failure. So thank you so much for that call to action and also capping off this entire Creative Catalyst event. And thank you for to everyone else who came out and sat through hours and hours of really, really interesting, but I'm, I'm sure also you guys are all quite exhausted now. So if you can also be just a bit patient with me, I'm actually gonna call my uh, two colleagues up. This is Nicole and Alex, have you forgotten that? And we're Madeline Co. And um, Steve's, I know you guys walked off, but I just wanted to say I did do my homework and I thought about what I was gonna do tomorrow, which is sleep. I'm gonna sleep a lot. And then I thought about what I'm doing this week, which is deinstalling this entire space. But then I also thought about what I'm doing for the rest of the year, which is, which is actually something I want to involve everyone here because we're all here because we want to make things happen and good social things happen. And I think it's a unique, diverse group that we brought together today. And I really want us to be able to keep working together and stay connected somehow. So if we can collectively mobilize somehow, and yes, go off and do your own thing, but also find ways to do it together, then that would be kind of the goal, the, uh, dare I say, catalyst of the entire conference. So thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. And um, just like, <laughs> oh. Thank you. Um, so being patient with me for one minute, a very, very important thank you, as I'm sure you've heard many thank yous from me today already, but um, I'm gonna invite my two lovely co-directors to stand here and do it with me. So first of all, I want to thank our team. Our team consists of many people, but first of all, um, Wendy Sukier, our PI, who you all saw this morning. Ginny Marchessault, who was actually an invisible PI, but was definitely a part of this conference, was unable to make this conference today, but is an incredibly important person to us. And we also have, of course, our research collaborators, Lorella DiCintio and Lori Petru, who both helped moderate today's discussion, so thank you so much. 
And we have we want to do a special thank you to Bodhi Collective, who um, you also got to hear from, Lynn on stage, who's so charming. And they helped build this entire installation, took like weeks of labor. So like that entire paper installation was just like hand, hand folded hours and hours of sleep deprived labor. So thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, I also want to thank Rachel Fender, who helped organize this entire event. So she's kind of like the glue that holds everything together. And she managed an incredible group of volunteers who you've seen kind of scattered around the event, scurrying around, handing microphones to people. So thank you to that group as well. Um, do you guys want to do some thank yous? OK, I'm going to continue. Um, I also want to thank all our sponsors, our sponsors, because Work doesn't happen without money. And we're really, really lucky to have supporters, um, OCE and Shirk, who funded this conference, but also people who, like the Japanese paper place, who gave us the paper for that installation, Steam Whistle, who gave, us, gave you all free beer yesterday, which is very nice, and um, Ryerson University, which you're all located in right now, but also is made up of the people who helped us make this happen, the students, the staff, the faculty. So thank you so much to Ryerson. And last but not least, thank you to everyone here. Again, most of you are speakers, but even those who are not speakers, you also contributed a lot to the discussion. So thank you so much, everyone. And I now release you. Thank you.